Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we gather this evening to discuss what our hopes are for Transform TO's strategy, how we might most effectively answer their survey questions. While we're doing so, it's important for those of us who are not Indigenous to this land to understand that Toronto is home to many diverse First Nation Inuit Métis peoples today and is subject to tre Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of New Credit. Additionally, we strive to honour the long-held covenant of the Dish with One Spoon, and that agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe that asks us uh, all to peaceably share and care for the land in the Great Lakes region. There are many ways for those of us in the climate movement to work to redress the wrongs of the past. One way is to understand, for example, that the decisions about how to remedy the climate crisis must not be made without the free and prior consent of the Indigenous nations concerned. While I'm normally in Toronto, I am I am one of those settlers who has a cottage. This one is in the Kawartha Highlands, the traditional hunting grounds of the Anishinaabe, part of the Williams Treaty of 1923. And I am actually there right now, thus I'm phoning in. In preparation for doing tonight's land acknowledgement, I challenged myself today to find out more about the land back movement and found a good place to start is two websites on the matter. One is the David Suzuki Foundation and the other is Ontario Nature's. Uh, those links I, I think Colleen will put in the chat for you. If there are others in tonight's gathering who are like myself, cottagers, um, I recommend reading that material. We must understand what it means to support the land back effort. At home, well, Indigenous stewards care for the High Park ancient oak savannas and are working with the Toronto City staff on a variety of fronts. It is a telling fact that while Indigenous people make up approximately 5% of the world's population, they're responsible for 8% of the Earth's remaining biodiversity. For, for more information on that, I recommend reading the website of the Indigenous Land Stewardship Circle. Finally, I cannot acknowledge the land without taking a moment to pledge to, to support Indigenous peoples as the horror of unmarked graves continues to unfold. One way we can show this support is by insisting that the federal government do right by Indigenous, Inuit and Métis children today. The court battle that the federal government is putting Indigenous children and their families through is fine. In short, the government is contesting the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal's ruling that the government, government must compensate children and their families who were inappropriately taken away from their parents and placed in foster care, including those living off reserves. And this is all very recent, um, uh, very recent, uh, or long-standing and very recent too. For more information on this, I went to the website of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, um, and I recommend that too. Thanks. Thank you so much, Val, um, for that wonderful land acknowledgement and all of the those reminders of actions we can take and our need to continue learning um, for those of us who are non-Indigenous, for those of us who are settlers. Um, it's so important to recognise uh, the facts of colonisation, what Indigenous people have lived through and are living through and do our best um, to support them as part of our work of climate justice. So thank you so much, Val. Um, I will now pass to Lynn, who is going to review the agenda with us, and I will just bring that up, just a moment. Thank you, Val. <clears throat> And welcome everyone. We have 25 people now, which is fantastic. We might have a few more join us. Um, and uh, we're first going to give some presentations. That's our, our topic for tonight, but not past 7.30. We're aiming by 7.30 to be breaking into smaller groups, um, probably you know, six to eight people per small group. And there we will talk about the net zero plans together. You can fill in your survey on your own on another um, tab on your computer, um, or you can, can do the survey later in the evening after the discussions have, have happened. 
Um, it's really up to you, but our goal is certainly that there will be lots of surveys go in to um, transform TO and that uh, we will also be able to report on our group discussion because I think there's going to be a lot more in our discussion as a group that wouldn't necessarily show up in just individual surveys because this is actually a really big thing that the city is trying to do with the project out the net zero. Um, and so I think I'll just move right into it. Does that, does that make sense? Because I'm going to cover just a few big picture things before we uh, look specifically at the Toronto's net zero plans. Um, and then Anne is coming after me to talk about why cities matter. Colleen will talk about uh, zero net zero and a just transition. And Mark will show the video that the Transform TO people have um, created. So um, I'm just going to say that uh, Climate Fast has been involved with Transform TO since 2015 when it was just an idea. It was just a concept and they were beginning a consultation process. And we had been working at the federal level for three years to get MPs to support carbon pricing, ending fossil fuel subsidies and developing renewables. Uh, and we decided to focus our work on the cities because 70% of emissions come from cities. Toronto was Canada's largest city. And that if we were going to make a difference to emissions, we were going to need to do it here at home. Uh, you know, you can really see it at the local level. You can, there's a lot you can do at the local level. It needs support from other levels of government, but there's an enormous amount that can be done here. So we worked um, with um, consultation processes with Transform TO for two years. And in 2017, uh, it was adopted, the plan, the program, Transform Teal was adopted unanimously by the Toronto City Council. It wasn't quite so unanimous when it came time to fund it at the budget time. And we learned that we have to advocate at budget time. So we started doing training and budget deputations and uh, campaigns to get pledges from councillors to fully fund Transform Teal. We did a lot of work to help the program get to where it is today, which is Certainly um, still, I would say a modest program, I have to say, given the crisis that we're in, but we know that the staff are quite dedicated and doing what they can with the, the time available and that they really appreciate the community engagement as well. So we've continued to develop our relationship with Transform TO um, over the four years the program has been operating. And, um, and I will say that two years ago, a very important event happened, which was the 2019 climate strike um, and the climate emergency declaration movement to get climate, climate emergency declarations passed. And Toronto did a substantial one. There were a lot of commitments made uh, on, in October 2019, October 2nd, it's actually Gandhi's birthday, the International Day of Nonviolence. I find that kind of nice that it happened on that day. Um, and, uh, but, you know, because of COVID and other delays, it, a lot of it has not been um, realized yet. But the purpose, uh, the, sorry, the commitment they made was to move from 80% to 2050 in 2050 to 100% of reduction in, by 2050 or sooner. They were supposed to be looking also at achieving that by 2040. So, um, as part of their commitments um, to that declaration, they said we will do net zero reports. We will bring these net zero reports back. And they brought the first one back last week, the same council meeting that we had our fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty adopted 22 to two. Give yourselves a round of applause, everybody, because I think a lot of people on this um, call wrote letters. Thank you to your councillors and the mayor. And, um, and they came through. So uh, we had that, and we also had the net zero building emissions report come through. Um, so this is part of the city building toward net zero. And so this summer consultation process is designed to get a read on what the community thinks about the things they're already planning to do. So a lot of what we're gonna look at tonight, um, the city has initial plans to, to do these areas, but they kind of want to get a read on what does the community say? What are really important to the community to see happen? Where do we see difficulties potentially in realizing some of these goals? And what kind of feedback do we want to give? I think they want to know too if there's red flags 
if people are going to react uh, to uh, resist any of the things that they want to do. Um, they, they really want to understand where community support is at for this net zero work. That's my read of it. And um, it's, you know, a three week period during July when a lot of people aren't around. So I think the fact that we can wrestle up people to comment is to our credit. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and, and being part of this and putting your voice in because it's when we put our voice in that the staff can report back to the city council versus that people in the community care. They really need to have that feedback and be able to say eight out of 10 people who filled up the survey thought that this is really important. And it, it really helps in terms of prioritizing what the city does. So I'm going to leave it at that as kind of background to where this uh, net zero consultation is coming from. And then I'm going to say that we at Climate Fast are extremely concerned about where we are at with climate. We see these tipping points uh, approaching way, way too fast and we don't see enough action happening. And we're advocating at all levels, federal, provincial and municipal to speed things up because uh, th we need accelerated action uh, and we need people to actually realize um, what the problems are. There's not enough news coverage, although we're certainly getting some with these forest fires, floods uh, around the world, people dying, it's starting to get some attention. And, um, and we have to turn that attention into, into actual action that helps. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but what the city can do, what we can do as individuals, as families, communities, and even as a city is limited in that if, if people aren't doing that in every other family, community, and city around the world, we won't get the reductions we need. So we need policies that and things like the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, we need agreements, policies that are all around the world that will take us where we need to go in the big picture. Because what we have is a huge transition and we wanted to just kind of explain to you, I mean, many of you will know this already, but I think it's important for us to understand the gravity of the, the situation that we're in and the enormity of this transition that we're trying to make in just a few years, because we haven't been making it in the last 30, 40 years that we've known about that we needed to make it, we haven't been making it. But if we get enough uh, pressure now, we may see that transition happen really quickly. Sometimes changes happen quickly when people suddenly realize this is where it's going. Fossil fuels are the past, and now we're on to renewables. So I'll show you a couple of, of uh, graphs. Um, hold on a second, see if I can find them here. Uh, Okay, that's my word. Sorry, it's just not showing me what I want to show. So I'll just give me one second, I'll, I'll find it. Okay, so this is, says a little bit about the big picture, and I'm just going to scroll down if I can on here to show you a couple of graphs. Scroll. Just for a bit of humor here is. Uh, a little cartoon. We spend a lot of time talking about COVID and dealing with COVID and trying to get over with COVID. And uh, we, um, you know, be sure to wash your hands and all will be well is the message over here, right? Um, and behind that is this recession. The economic system is really out of whack, uh, given all that we've been through. Um, uh, many, many changes, but it, what we may not see and we hardly talk about is climate change, which is a huge threat coming behind there and biodiversity collapse. So these are threats we need to talk about, we need to act on, we need to deal with them. 
Um, 80% of the energy that we use today here in Canada and around the world is from fossil fuels. So to get 100% off fossil fuels and onto renewables conservation is a huge undertaking and we shouldn't underestimate it. And you know, people, it's not gonna happen without people noticing that things are changing. Um, now our government keeps talking about uh, reducing emissions, but we're not actually reducing emissions. So 1990 to 2018, Canada is up 20%, whereas in the UK, they're down 40, 40%. There, there's certainly no model, like in terms of the UK, in terms of they're still doing lots of bad things, um, but they're way ahead of us in terms of actually addressing emissions. And for all our talk, we are not um, doing the action that's required. Um, I'll just show you um, this graph shows uh, that in fact, you know, we're decarbonizing the grid. This is electricity here, the yellow line. Uh, sorry, it's the green line. My apologies, sorry. But you can see that by decarbonizing the grid, we're starting to um, reduce uh, the impact of uh, the grid in terms of emissions. Um, however, the province of Ontario wants to recarbonize the, the grid by making us rely on gas plants for electricity, which would bring these emissions up, okay? So we can see how it can change these emissions things, or it can stay the same if we don't do a lot about it, or it can get worse as it's been happening with oil and gas because we have not told them to stop, keep it in the ground. We're not doing this anymore. Um, so what changed recently as the International Energy Agency said that we have to stop, no more production of oil and gas, phase out existing as soon as possible because we, we are over full of carbon emissions, we can't take any more. And that was pretty amazing for the IEA to do because they're a mainstream body that has always been supportive of oil and gas. Now they're not. They say renewables is the way to go. Um, but they also talk about uh, carbon capture and storage, SMRs and hydrogen. Um, so they have, have big technologies that they also wanna bring in on top of renewables. Um, I'm not going to get into it because that's not a topic of the evening, but just to let you know that there's also a report called the Fossil Fuel Exit Strategy from the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty people that, out, uh, that outlines ways to achieve emissions cuts without needing nuclear CCS. And um, I'm not sure what they do with hydrogen. They probably include green hydrogen, but not the other kinds. But they, you can those reports, I'll find them and we'll put them in the chat. And you can... Um, take a look at them to kind of get the big picture. That's the part that I'm, I'm trying to give you here for just a few minutes. Um, so the things that we, we're gonna talk about tonight are things that are within our control in our communities and they're important, they're things we can do. And we also need to know that we also need to get the rest of the country and um, the rest of the world to stop using fossil fuels and to get with this program of transition in this decade, this is the, decisive decade, so I'll take the action now. Okay, I'm just gonna show you one more very tiny, little quick little graph just to show you. This is from the IEA report and it shows, um, you know, this is historical, get, uh, uh, sorry, historical demand for coal, that's the brown one, the new one, um, oil is the red one and gas is the, the gray one. And then they're projected. And this is the thing about these graphs. Whenever we see what's actually happening, they're always going up. Whenever we see what's projected, they're like going down and quite steeply down. So is that realistic? Is that practical? Is that really gonna happen? That's gonna depend a lot on what policies we have and whether everybody gets on board and we actually make these kinds of cuts. So I think that's it for now and I'll stop sharing. Um, thank you, just wanted to give you the little bit of the big picture. Um, we'll do more of it at other events, but for purposes of tonight, that, that's enough. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, that it is really important to get the big picture um, and it is really important to address the production of fossil fuels and to really name that as a problem that has to be addressed. I'm just going to put in a big, a little spiel actually for why action at the city level is really important. Um, so just a few points to note. So 
cities um, across the world are responsible for 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So what cities do really matter. Some cities, of course, produce way more than other cities, but municipal climate action, city climate action really does make a difference. Um, cities are also places, as we know, having been through COVID, that are riven by inequities. We have all of us been looking at the maps of Toronto and are very aware of who has been most affected by COVID and who has not been um, as affected. And that will surely map on, is mapping on to the, the impacts of climate change. So when we're addressing climate action in the city, at the city level, we need to be also thinking about these inequities. And the Transform TO team certainly are doing that. So that is something um, certainly to keep in mind. Um, cities, as also as Lynn pointed to, cities make climate action tangible. So things happening in your neighborhood, solar panels going up, the expansion of green space, better transit, that makes climate action real and good and people can see that happening. And that, I think that is also really important. Cities are centers of innovation, education um, and activism. And here in Toronto, we have a plethora of wonderful citizen activist groups um, who are increasingly joining forces. So it is an exciting time to be involved in social justice and climate justice activism. And I think cities are another place in which these coalitions are being built. And we um, very much like to want to be a part of that. And then I'll just lastly end with the fact that Toronto I'm not originally from Toronto, I'm originally from Australia. And it, one of the ways for me, which makes Toronto such a special city is that it is such an international city. So there are people in our city coming from all over the world who have friends and family who are being impacted by climate change in their countries of origin and who are also aware of solutions that are being implemented in their countries of origin too. So Toronto is such is an amazing place in which we can um, think about climate solutions, enact climate solutions, and learn and spread the word at the same time. So that's my plug. And I will now hand to Colleen, who is going to talk about zero, net zero, and the just transition. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks, Dan. I am actually going to lead us into the exercise tonight and the breakout tonight as well. And so I'm going to try to screen share and maybe, Anne, you can nod if you can see what I'm screen sharing because I, I tried to set it up. So let's just see. Can you see that? Okay, great. So just, um, we, are, we are looking tonight at uh, Transform PO's net zero, plan to get net to net zero. So in general, net zero means, of course, that we're balancing the output of our greenhouse gases with the drawdown. So however much we output through fossil fuels or making cement or whatever, we have to match that by how much we draw down, like the forest and the technology that captures and sequesters carbon. So I don't know about you, but intuitively I feel like outputting less is, is the first step. So on a Toronto level, we've heard from Anne and we know that Toronto is a really big player. On a Toronto level, that can mean um, the two major things are natural gas for home heating, so fuel switching, and the gasoline we use in our personal vehicles. So fuel switching, energy efficiency, reducing the need for individual vehicles, ways to make sure we're not outputting as much. Um, but as uh, Lynn touched on as well, in the Transform PO discussion guide, they emphasize that we also need to be advocates at the provincial level, because we need to protect the cleanness of our electricity grid and that is kind of threatened at the provincial level so um, advocacy is part of it and on the federal level as well because they are not actually prioritizing the um, fossil fuel shift in their climate plans as much as they seem to be um, re relying on technology that hasn't really been produced at the scale it needs to yet um, and we need the federal level to actually reinforce the local solutions that we want to see 
And I just wanted to name a few of those, which will help with the direct drawdown. And that's uh, exciting. These are in the, the comments that we're going to talk about in a few, a few minutes. Um, but the, the ability to generate energy on a local level, renewable energy, um, and solar installations on a local level and district energy projects. I just find th th those ideas really exciting and we do need support um, from other levels on that. And Anne mentioned this, but in the discussing guide, they mention in Transform Peel, they highlight social equity. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about what that means for them. It means um, issues of prosperity and equity in health and making sure that communities are not unfairly impacted any specific communities. So that is a big part of what they're asking us to do tonight is to think about our communities um, and what the actions would mean on that level. So I just wanted to stress that to create and maintain a livable future, climate action can leave no one behind. And they mentioned that in the discussion guide as well, not leaving your community behind. So we need to know, uh, we need to understand what the actions will mean. Um, so as you know already, and Lynn showed that wonderful graph, but we have multiple entwined crises and they're all interconnected and, and the changes we need, like um, uh, challenging colonialism and extractive capitalism are the same that we need to handle most of these, these crises that we have. So successful climate action is action on these intertwined ex existential issues. And so that can include like safe housing and good health, uh, migrant rights. It could include um, many, many different aspects of food security. They're all entwined. So I just wanted to mention that. I know that uh, the Transform Peel plan is trying to, um, to to do that. And I'm really I'm really happy with that. So the consultant stuff for tonight, they're looking for feedback to help prioritize the short-term actions needed to reach the 2030 goals. And, and also they wanna know how those climate actions will not leave your community behind. So I'm not going to actually read all of this, just a couple of things. So some of the things are like, how will your community be challenged? And will those challenges affect some more than others? Uh, how might the actions be implemented in a fair way, affordably, accessibly? How do they, how they further health and well-being, create jobs? These are all things we could think about when we think about the questions. And just, just to highlight one thing, for example, like when I did the survey, I thought, well, yes, a circular economy is great, but if we don't have products on the shelves or repair cafes in a community that are affordable, my community will have trouble with you know, making sure that happens. So that's just an example. And also purchasing an EV, even with incentives. I know some people in my community will have trouble. So, you know, it, it's worth thinking about that. So the three questions that we are going to comment on in the breakouts are here below. And I'm going to stop screen sharing and put them in the chat so all the breakout leaders have them. Uh, and we all have them to start our breakouts with. So I'll do that and I'll, 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 leave, it, um, I'll leave it to Mark to show us a video, a little introductory video about what we're doing tonight and, and go put that in the chat. Welcome to the City of Toronto's Transform TO, Getting to Net Zero Online Consultation. This video will provide an overview of some of the actions that can help us get greenhouse gas emissions in Toronto to net zero by 2050 or sooner, and will let you know how you can get involved. Indigenous perspectives and worldviews are important to our net zero future. If we were meeting in person in the city of Toronto, we would acknowledge that the land we were meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We would also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. In recent years, we've felt the growing impacts of a warming climate. Toronto's weather is expected to get hotter, wetter, and wilder as climate risks increase. We all need to act urgently to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In October 2019, Toronto City Council voted unanimously to declare a climate emergency to accelerate ongoing efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change, joining dozens of leading cities around the world in this global effort. In response, we are realigning the city's climate action strategy, called Transform TO, towards an accelerated emissions reduction target of net zero by 2050 or sooner while creating a more livable and prosperous Toronto for current and future generations. 
Our path to net zero includes climate actions that were informed by input we received from thousands of Torontonians between 2016 and 2020. We've heard you loud and clear, Toronto. You want immediate climate action that leaves no one behind. This includes a green and equitable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So what exactly does net zero mean? Net zero is achieved when we decarbonize our city, meaning we change how we move, build, use and generate energy and generate and dispose of our waste so that the greenhouse gases we produce are as close to zero as possible. Reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and getting to net zero will contribute to global action to protect our climate and create a more climate resilient Toronto, a city that is low carbon and energy efficient and also better prepared to withstand the stress and shocks of future heat waves, flooding and ice storms. Reducing emissions to net zero can advance social equity when it's done in a way that every person in the city can benefit from without unfairly impacting specific communities. As we transform our city, we'll transform our health and economy. We know that climate actions will improve our air quality, create new job opportunities, and get us actively moving around our city. If we're going to get to net zero by 2050 or sooner, we need to act now. The path to net zero includes reaching an interim target cutting our 2018 greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. This is a critical milestone to ensure we are on track. This means targeting the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions in our city, including our buildings. 55% of local greenhouse gas emissions come from our buildings, which emit greenhouse gases when fossil fuels, such as natural gas, are used as a heat source and during construction and the manufacturing of building materials. Our transportation, 36% of local greenhouse gas emissions come from our vehicles. Burning fossil fuels for our cars, trucks, ships, and trains creates greenhouse gases. 73% of transportation emissions come from our personal vehicles that are powered by gasoline. Our waste, 9% of local greenhouse gas emissions come from our waste. Most greenhouse gas emissions from waste come from landfills where organic materials break down and emit gases. So, how will we reach net zero? Our path to net zero is founded on bold climate actions that will help us meet our 2030 goals and get us to net zero by 2050 or sooner. With previous input from Torontonians, we've identified several important climate actions for reducing emissions from each of the biggest sources of greenhouse gases in Toronto. We'll focus on ensuring new buildings have near zero emissions and use low carbon building materials. We'll also continue to focus on retrofitting existing buildings, including residential homes. This requires bold actions like implementing the Toronto Green Standard for new buildings and supporting building owners to make retrofits that improve comfort and affordability. There is a need for local renewable energy generation. This requires bold actions like producing our own renewable natural gas from waste, increasing the use of solar power, and advocating to other levels of government to ensure low carbon energy policies. The rapid uptake of electric vehicles while encouraging active transportation and public transit use is critical to reaching our net zero goals. This requires bold actions such as increasing incentives for electric vehicles, more charging stations, for example, and continuing to move toward fully electrifying the TTC fleet. We'll advance toward a zero-waste, circular economy where the focus is on product longevity, renewability, reuse, and repair. We must also further decrease our waste, including food waste. Actions may also include removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere by planting more trees, ensuring that we make climate-informed decisions, and increasing community-wide involvement, all of which will positively contribute to the livability and resilience of our city. You can help us prioritize which climate actions should be implemented in the short term to make sure we meet our 2030 goals. Effectively reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and reaching net zero means leaving no one behind. So while you're considering which climate actions should be implemented first, also give some thought to what these actions might look like in your community as we travel the path to net zero together. 
please visit transformto.ca to view the broad range of climate actions and complete the survey to provide your feedback. Or consider hosting a discussion with your community to help shape the TransformTO net zero strategy. The strategy will be presented to Toronto City Council this fall. We look forward to your feedback on how these proposed climate actions could help shape our net zero future. For more information about TransformTO and to see what the city is doing to reduce emissions and take action on climate change, visit transformto.ca. Thank you, Mark, for sharing and thank you, Colleen. And now I'm going to ask Mark to send us into our breakout rooms and we can get to work. Thank you. Hi, I guess we're all in the main room still, but we might as well run our breakout here. <laughs> so um, welcome again. I um, have put the questions in the chat, but they're very tiny, so I, I can read them out as well. And we are going to um, need a note taker. Val, are you able to take notes? Yes, I can take notes. Thank you. Um, and the other way that you can do it is when we when we ask the questions, you could answer in the chat. And we're going to save the chat, and then we'll have your answers to help fill out a, um, a survey together, like a, a submission together. But you're also welcome to take your ideas and, and do the survey yourself afterwards or now. Um, if you need the link to the survey again, just let me know, and I'll find it again for you. Um, so the other thing I can do if this group wants and I'm gonna actually put you on gallery view again so I can see you all. Yeah, I can screen share the different actions that are proposed in each category. Would that be helpful? And then we can see which ones you like or wanna prioritize. Oh uh, yes, and I should ask you, do you want the recording? Do you mind if, it's still, if this little breakout's recorded? Cause that would be another way that would help us capture your ideas. Is that okay? And does anybody not want it recorded? Okay, just, just step, um, step up if you want me to stop the recording, but I'm going to screen share the actions that are proposed and then maybe we can we can look at the questions after that. Um, so let me just find my uh, my window again. I think I was so happy I was done my presentation. I <laughs> I shut my window. So let me find it here. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll screen share again so you can see. There are a lot of them, and I know it's going to be kind of a cluttered slide. So maybe we should look at each one and then look at the questions again. So for buildings, these are the ones that they are proposing. And you're supposed to, in the survey, pick your top three that you think we should do first at a city level. So we have the Toronto Green Standard. Now, that is mostly a standard for city buildings. Um, to reach a certain level of um, net zero readiness um, and also design requirements for uh, net zero ready private buildings by 2030 or sooner. It is a higher standard than the provincial level and it doesn't always override the provincial level, but in the cases that it does, it's really helpful. And then the second one is required net zero emissions for construction of city owned buildings. Uh, the third was support building owners to use low carbon materials in the actual construction. And the fourth was requirements to report on and limit DHDs from homes and buildings. So like you were gonna, if you're gonna sell your home, you'd have to report on your DHD rating. Um, the second to last one there is support early action to make retrofits that improve efficiency, comfort, and switch off of fossil fuel heating easier and more affordable for homeowners and building owners. Um, 
my one thing about this is it is that this is not early action, <laughs> but it is good. It is good. It's a good point. And the last one is support the creation of jobs in the building sector and build industry capacity to enable rapid transformation and scale up the retrofits of existing buildings. So you, I'm going to stop screen sharing and we can look at the three questions and apply them to some of these things. And maybe if you want to share what you're feeling, you can, or if you just want to make notes, or if you want to share in chat, uh, all of the above is perfectly welcome. So did any of those strike you as a priority? Um, that's the first question. What are the most important do you think in the short term? You just speak up if you want. Yes, yes. I think everything depends on financing. No matter what we're talking about, whether it's buildings or transportation, or waste or whatever, I think everything comes back to financing. So that has to be dealt with. Like, where's the money coming from? Is it going to be coming? Like, the city, I don't think, has the money. So is it going to come coming from the province? Is it going to be coming through the federal government? Um, and how are we going to arrange this? How are we going to push these other um, groups, these other political groups, to, to help finance all these things? That sound great, but need to push to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where the advocacy comes in. And it really, they did really emphasize that in the discussion guide that we need to advocate. I think the federal level is responsible for quite a bit of that. And then the provincial level for some as well. So yes, definitely. Does anybody have a feeling about any of the points that we do have at the city level there? Uh, I, I, think, uh, I, I think that they're, um, they're, they're good points. I mean, we need to retrofit existing. And we have to prioritize that. Um, but, you know, I don't think they're aggressive enough. I'd like to see, for example, zero new buildings, new, no new homes, no new high rises with smokestacks. I mean, how hard would that be to mandate? Because then all of a sudden, you know, the developers that are building these communities would say, oh, well, we better do at least the hot water heating with mm -hmm. um, you know, panels on the roof. I mean, you see it in Europe, you see it in other countries, but in Canada, mm -hmm. we see none of it. And I know winter is a problem, but we're never gonna look seriously at solutions. Like how do we make the 2030 unless we're willing to get aggressive on some of the obvious things? So, I mean, it should just be a switch. No smokestacks on new construction. And then, you know, mm -hmm. older existing buildings, it's more of a challenge because sometimes it's harder to retrofit them with the, you know, the proper insulation. Um, so, I mean, I don't think anybody would disagree with any of those suggestions on the list, but I think mm -hmm. now we'd like to see something more, um, you know, more deliberate. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, that's you my know, two things. That's great. And I want to share and chat, you maybe remember, there is an idea board and there's a link for it. And if you've got an idea like that, which I think is a great one, you can add it to the communal idea board that Transform PO will get. Um, I think that could sure. be a good place. For, for that type of, of thing. It's really, it's really, and it, I agree with you, the net zero building standard, which has just been adopted, the new report, um, will accelerate some actions, but I totally think you're right. Um, we need more aggressive action on the retrofit front too. Anybody else have a thought? Yes, Mark? I have a question, which is, do we know how many city owned buildings there are or how we define that? Because if, if it's a smaller number than in, in regards to private homes um, or apartment buildings or uh, office buildings, that, that then I don't know if it's as, as relevant. Obviously it's important to do that as well, but I don't know if the number is equal to the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that the truth is that it's the individual homeowned and small uh, landlord owned buildings that are responsible for most of the emissions in the city. So Mark, that's a very good point to remember. I mean, the city does lead and if the city adopts things, they, they make uh, the economy of scale more possible for other people. Like if they start the construction industry producing things and they hire them and they, they give them an influx of money, then they can then make it cheaper for individuals and you know what I mean? So it's a bit of a process, but it's, it, it's definitely a lesser number of, of buildings. 
city-owned properties are also there's the green will initiative if everybody anybody is interested in looking that up that the mayor is really behind in encouraging the um larger properties to shift so i mean i'm with you mark i think um clarifying that and if if it is true which i really think it is that um the city buildings aren't responsible for as many admissions emissions then that's worth thinking about um i'm gonna move on to the next question because I'm really curious about it. And so do you think some of these would be challenging? Which ones would be the, like what shifts are gonna be the most challenging for your community based on what they're planning to do? I can, uh, I can until I see someone put their hands up, I'm gonna start. I have an old historic neighborhood with very high poverty rate here. There are many, many people who will not be able to retrofit their homes with the cost that they'll still have to undertake. Um, so my concern for my community would be, what kind of funding are they going to get? Incentives are they going to get um, when the regulations kick in? Um, so I'd be very concerned that there's some way of, of equity, um, equity producing mechanisms. Um, and I know some of the programs from, from Chance from CEO, like uh, the local level, like the HELP program for low-income families are good, but maybe not good enough. So that would be my concern. Um, does anybody else have a thought on that for their own communities? Yes? I live in a condo and the condo is 45 years old. So obviously it's going to take a lot to retrofit a condo with the cement walls and floors and all that kind of stuff. So like if you're going electric, the whole electrical panel has to be redone, for instance. Um, if you want my car to be able to um, rejuvenate overnight, you've got to have an electrical outlet there for me to, to plug into. And those are enormous costs. So again, it's financing, just as you were talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah the the bus bars aren't heavy enough in most of those high rises if if we replace the cars with electric cars it's going to become you know a, a huge challenge and i think that it, rather than doing it you know one building here and then one building over there 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 has to, toronto hydro has to take the initiative and say hey we're going down this street and we're going to dig because many of these bus bars are underground too and we're gonna dig and we're gonna, you know, we'll have the equipment there just once because unfortunately, when a building tries to do it independently, uh, it's super expensive. But if you get Toronto Hydro saying, okay, we're gonna go down these streets and we'll do that in conjunction with, you know, replacing a sidewalk or whatever the case might be. But, but there is no coordination right now for that. And, and we're talking about some fairly heavy duty stuff. And Toronto Hydro has said they do need to replace the hydro feeds uh, when we have electric vehicles in these high rises. So um, we'd like to see coordination in that area. That's a wonderful point. And um, I just want to share the Toronto Hydro. Some of us have voiced concerns before about Toronto Hydro being so central to the plan and um, nudging them along to sort of, they have uh, apparently a mechanism where they can fund projects that will increase equity but they need to be pushed to do that, right? So I think um, you're onto something with us needing to have some way of holding accountability and getting getting the, the process that we need. So I, I love that idea. I'm gonna invite anyone who hasn't spoken to say something. And if you don't want to, we'll move on to the next section. Gail or Nina or Suleiman, did you want to say anything or are we okay to move on? The only thing that I would say is that um, I think Stephen is perfectly right. The financing end of this is crucial. Like most of the money for retrofits is going to come from the federal level, and it is inadequate, totally inadequate, to deal with the issues that all of you are discussing. So again, I think public advocacy uh, does have to be at all levels for the sake of the municipality, if you will. But that retrofit program at the federal level is not going to be adequate for the city of Toronto. Yeah. Thank you, Gail, for underlining that. I think that's a really good point. Okay. So I'm going to. Holly. I'll go on mute. Yes, Stop. Oh, sorry. I just yeah. wanted to say that um, 
like I find these uh, that I wouldn't be able to choose from these three. And I think I'm hearing lots of people saying that that um, you know the message we want to get across is financing from the feds in particular and coordination on the part of Toronto Hydro. So uh, I'm hoping that everybody uh, writes that in their um, you know in the notes. Uh, in the survey as part of the survey yeah like even more important than checking anything off <laughs> mm -hmm. so, absolutely i'm thinking, totally agree yeah. yeah totally agree um so i will move on to the next section because you'll have a lot to say about um this one too i think um so the next section is oh my computer's so slow it's energy itself so this one I love because I do like some of their ideas, but let me read them. Produce renewable natural gas from waste. Increase installation of rooftop and ground mount solar panels. Support district energy system owners and developers with the implementation of low carbon energy solutions and accelerate investment in energy storage. And work with other levels of government. Here we are again. To ensure low carbon and resilient energy policies to enable local solutions. So I'm going to actually do two at once here. How about that? Because um, then we can think about both of them when we respond. Transportation, uh, increase uptake of electric vehicles through incentives. Increase electric vehicle charging in public spaces and on private property. Ban use of and support for low emission freight and last mile delivery strategies. Expand bike and pedestrian infrastructure and priority zones expand public transit and accelerate impl implementation of bus rapid transit and continue electrification of the TTC fleet. So that's a lot, but to sort of summarize, we've got the energy, you know, um, the uh, renewable energy, the solar panels, the district energy, um, and we've got the transportation, which you've already started to talk about and address. So I'm gonna put out the first question again, and what do you think if you were gonna prioritize these, which would you want to prioritize? And anybody who wants to can uh, jump in or put your hand up either way. Recording in progress for like five minutes. Okay, I'm to... waiting for somebody else. Go ahead, Gail. No, no, I, I was just going to ask uh, that you put the points up on the uh, whiteboard again or whatever. Okay, I can do that. Yes. Which, right. which ones do you want? Do you want the energy or the uh, transportation deal or both? Well, I think, I think it was the energy one that we were dealing with, right? We're going to do both if we can. Uh, oh, um, I, I see. All right. Um, do, yes. Well, I, th I think working with other levels of government uh, is, is the key here. Um, again, Toronto's budget is very limited, right? Um, so I don't know what kind of investment they can make in renewable natural gas from waste or um, the, you know, to increase the installation of rooftop and ground mount solar power and the panels. Again, you have to go after the owners of these properties or the builders of them. And the, the city has to rely on its power to mandate codes and mandate these things because they, they haven't got the ability to pay for it. It's, it's that simple. And, and to make sure that we move to renewable energy, the, the province of Ontario is going in the other direction. It is calling on using gas again. And, and OPG is, is going to small modular nuclear reactors at a humongous cost. It is not investing in local energy generation. You know, these are all huge problems. The degree to which the city of Toronto could use its voice, it has to use, the city itself has to use its voice on behalf of the people of the city to advocate mm -hmm. against these, these positions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Um, I'm getting an echo here, but Stephen, did you have something to say? Uh, what I was going to talk about is some things on transportation. And the first thing is the affordability of, of cars if we're looking at electric cars. Um, right now, I mean, I would love to even have a hybrid, but even a hybrid, 
is pretty darn expensive compared to what you know you'd pay for a a gas car a car to use gas so that, that's one thing the price of the cars themselves have to really come down quite a bit in conjunction with that the charging stations whether it's at home or whether it's on the road have to be faster and this is like needs an inf uh, an influx of of, of money in in, in in innovation to to get the charging stations to be as fast as we have now with gas cars um like 20 minutes if, if i drive to montreal and i fill up twice that's 40 minutes more on a six hour drive that's that's a lot um so i think those two things are are important to me as far as transportation and getting us away from gas powered vehicles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you steven now i can't see people as well when i'm screen sharing so if somebody else wants to pop in you can uh <laughs> sure, <yay>. sure. <laughs> go ahead I'll, I'll, I'll pop in at the, at the risk of getting into trouble no i am um, <laughs> You know, I, I don't, I haven't met anybody on this call, but I'm, you know, the founder of Trellis. And Trellis is a transportation system where people move in pods. You may have heard about it in the public right of way. So when you're replacing the hydro poles to put charges on them for cars and you're bringing in higher uh, amperage capability, you just, you design it and you can hang the, the rail. It's a micro rail. And this is one of the things that I found so frustrating you know, some of the LRTs like the Eglinton West is $750 million a kilometer. And we've shown that Trellis will be on the order of 20 million. So I'm not going to go on about it, but <laughs> to make transit reach everybody, to expand transit out so that people can get deliveries on it, you need a system like Trellis that's affordable that can come to every building. And, and you know, when you get your meal, you'll get it on plates and you'll send the plates back you know, take out food is just incredibly hard on the environment. The problem is in our society right now, we actually don't, it, it is business as usual. I hate to say this, but in transportation, it is business as usual. Those LRTs, the amount of construction materials, five meters of gravel and concrete, uh, bus rapid transit just slows down, clogs the arteries. So anyway, my little pitch for Trellis, <laughs> But Trellis Transit is, is an answer, but it, it, you see, it won't even appear in these things because nobody wants to talk about, uh, you know, something mm -hmm. disruptive, right? Uh -huh. this, is, yeah. this is essentially business as usual, what, what's on yeah. here, right? There's nothing that radical on this list. Electrification of TTC, you know, bus, dedicated bus lanes. No, transportation needs to come off the ground. We rip up the tarmac, we plant trees, we have bike lanes and walking on the ground and then transportation just, you know, moves up above. Anyway. That's, that's so cool. It's so cool. And you must put that on the idea board. I put that link in there. I hope you jump on that because they're not leaving that a, a lot of space for new ideas here and you can put them there, I think, which would be great. Yes, um, I definitely lovely. will. I, I definitely Yay. will. <laughs> Yay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody I think else it's a great, a great yeah. last mile delivery strategy. So I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, does anyone else want to say anything on these two slides before we, the, the other question? Yes, Mark. Great. Go ahead, Mark. Colleen, I just wanted to read something that Mina put in the chat. Oh, awesome. So she I says, uh, they say promoting the installation of bike routes definitely feels like an action that could be implemented in the short term. Based mm -hmm. on the pilot project for the bike lane along Bloor Street, there seems to be a lot of economic benefits. That's also a very equitable um, thing to go about. Like if in my area, they're doing, hopefully doing some bike lanes soon because it's, it's not safe. So, you know, increasing it in different areas is I think a way to, to be equitable as well. So I like that one. Um, so I am going to move on to the next one if you don't mind. We're supposed to have until 8.30 and we have three more sections. We can always come back if we get done a little early. Um, the next one, is sustainable consumption and waste. So the three they've highlighted here are conduct a citywide consumption-based emissions inventory. They have not done that yet, by the way, <laughs> and set a reduction target. I mean, that hasn't been done before, so that would be new. 
uh, reduce citywide material consumption and increase circularity. Um, for example, the efficient reuse and recovery of resources. Bless you. And three, continue outreach and engagement on citywide waste production and diversion with a focus on food and organic waste. So there's just three here. Um, and I'm interested, first of all, they wanna know our priority. And just to, just to let you know, they actually, in the actual survey, they lump all three of the next ones together. And you're supposed to prioritize four. So, um, I'm just going to show them because otherwise you don't see them all. Okay, so they love green space and it's consumption and waste. And the green space is increased tree canopy cover, biodiversity, and enhanced green spaces, and achieve equitable distribution of urban forests, increasing the tree canopy where it's most needed. And the third one they lump in, um, and we have to pick four on the survey of these, is decision making and equitable engagement. So it's corporate-wide adoption of a climate lens for all new city operating programs and capital projects. So that climate considerations and is in the municipal decision-making process throughout. Uh, focus on outreach on equity-seeking groups to lead and implement local climate action. Work with indigenous communities to share knowledge. Focus on youth engagement and leadership and establish a climate advisory group. So in the first, the first, as I said, my, our first job on the survey is to pick four of these, <laughs> and they're not even in the same category, so that's a little bit hard, but um, I, if you want to give any opinions on any of them, that would be a great start, maybe. I was under the impression that there is a climate advisory group for the City of Toronto. Hmm. I don't think so yet. <laughs> they did consult consultations in a wide uh, in a, of a wide variety of people but I think they were temporary groups so that's probably what they're trying to make more permanent uh, uh, Colleen can I say something it's Val here yeah Val sure pop it in yeah I was just thinking that like having us have to choose between you know equity seeking groups to be local climate action, working with Indigenous communities, focusing on youth. I wonder if, again, what I'm thinking I might do here is check, establish a climate advisory group, and then explain what I mean, which is that in that group, we have to have youth, Indigenous, equity-seeking representation. In other words, get at you know, that engagement through that group. I don't know what people think of that, but... Um, Mm -hmm. Yes, you're getting thumbs up. <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah, that's a great one. We could, we could certainly, definitely and, you know, basically, ex basically explaining that, you know, all of those people, all of those groups need to be um, part of. This mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Um, does anybody have anything else to weigh in on in, in any of those categories? The green space, consumption and waste? Yeah, Steven? Well, to go back to the, the first one we were talking about there at the end, the last one, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is corporate-wide adoption of a climate lens. We have to have a city-wide adoption of a climate lens. And um, Gail and I are kind of in a group that have looked at um, the donut economy, it's called, where there is a full adoption of all the, the things we're talking about. And the city has to consider all the different ways of using um, energy and how to save energy and et cetera, how to produce energy um, that it won't, so, it, so that it won't hurt um, any, anybody, any city um, at all. And there are cities that have adopted the donut economy or just starting to try to use it. Um, so I think we have to look not only at the corporate adoption of the climate lens, but the city adoption of a climate lens. Really, everything has to be, you know, in that donut, <laughs> it has to be uh, included. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I like that the donut economics are becoming more widely known, but not enough. So, yep, that's that's great. Um, yeah, and I, I, if I could if I could add to that just a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I I think it's not just a climate lens; it's it's to address the climate crisis. The we we need a total transformation of what we're doing. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's like the smokestacks, like why don't we have a mandate right now that anything new, there is no smokestack, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and somebody would say, oh, well, this is a climate sustainable building or there's a subdivision going in somewhere and it's gonna be sustainable, but is it really? We need to look at it in terms of the climate crisis. Um, and, and the same thing with transportation, um, you know, these things that are being installed are not, you know, if they're not financially, sustainable, let alone uh, electrically sustainable. When an LRT is 48,000 kilograms, right? There's no attempt to, they say, well, it's electric. It doesn't matter if we waste the energy. Well, nobody talks about, well, Pickering's got to close. Should have closed 15 years ago, but it's going to have to close. Mm -hmm. There's issues there. And when it, yeah, when it yeah. shuts down, how are we going to power these massive LRTs running around empty except for peak periods? So it's not yeah. just a climate lens. That's the, that's the challenge with some of these things. It's to actually look at the climate crisis and to be really frugal with energy and with, with you know, using paper dishes and other things. So yes, I, I yes, think yes. all of these need to be much more aggressive. 2030 is gonna come up really fast and yeah. I don't think we're gonna make it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And I think we do need to keep pushing. I keep getting really alarming articles in my inbox. <laughs> and yeah, for sure. Um, I wanna just also say that I didn't take too long in my presentation, but I really think sometimes it's difficult. I guess this is my two cents. When you're looking at a climate plan, it's too isolated from the other plans we need to have ongoing, like the, biodiversity, the city's biodiversity plan, the city's anti-poverty plan, like, like the donut economics that you're mentioning. Everything is intersectional. And if we're trying to silo everything and make the decisions in these yeah. silos, it's not just a climate lens, like Steve was saying. It's, we need an everything lens. <laughs> um, and I, I do get a little nervous about that, even though I think the city of Toronto and their climate um, plan is better than a lot and they've done a lot of good work. I still, I still get, like you're saying, overall system change is totally necessary and we're not going to get that unless we put things together. Um, so, so that I, that's like the sense. <laughs> Does anyone have anything to say about how these three sections will actually directly impact your communities? Um, um, I guess this one talks about outreach for waste reduction on food and organic waste. Yeah, the citywide mm -hmm. consumption uh, emissions inventory, that would be amazing, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that could be the foundation on which we start looking at, uh, at areas that we really need to address. Um, oh you know, that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, like, if you don't have reduction targets oh, yeah. tied yeah. to specific emissions and specific items, it's very mm -hmm. hard to say, well, okay, we're going to cut by 50% by 2030. Well, how are we going to do that? Because we don't, we don't actually have it broken down. So uh, that, yeah. that first one, whoever wrote that was, I think was really thinking because if we yeah. have that, yeah. we can set the target. Yeah, they've been they've been um, asked to do that. I think by uh, different groups who've seen the, the need for that. So it's really good to see it in here. Um, yeah, uh, Stephen, I think you had your hand up as well. Yes, I wanted to talk about the second point here: increasing circularity. It's my understanding from things I've read in the newspaper that a lot of the stuff that we're supposedly recycling now does not get recycled, and it's a huge percentage that I've heard up to 70% of mm -hmm. the stuff that we put into recycle doesn't get recycled. So, I mean, where's that at? I mean, why is that happening? Um, again, maybe it's, it's a, the need for innovation and how to do things, but the money has to be put in for research and innovation, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and, and the, rules, the rules can't be different you know, for condos and, and apartment buildings than they are from homeowners. Like a lot of that problem derives from the fact that you, you get much more diligent uh, 
waste shortage uh, by individual homeowners than you do out of these huge buildings where everything just goes into these bins, right? Mm -hmm. Not properly sorted. I think the regulatory structure has to be clearer and fairer, okay? And, and put some real onus on, on the people who live in high rises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really worth pointing out there's such a difference, you know, um, I, I would like to say that's an equity issue as well, because in some apartment buildings, yes, it is. yeah, the, um, the, the process isn't there, right? So mm -hmm. the landlord needs to be, um, be enabled or pressured or both, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody else want to say anything about waste? Yes, Stephen? There, there has to be a more overall decision of what can be recycled. Because mm -hmm. you go from one area to the other and it's different things that are recyclable. Mm -hmm. I mean, we started off with these numbers on the bottoms of containers and they, um, they're not used anymore. Um, so, you know, like you can work in one area, live in another area and different things are recyclable and it gets confusing. So mm -hmm. again, we have to kind of work together and figure out mm -hmm. what is recyclable, what isn't, and have those kind of plants all over, all over Ontario, all over Canada, all over wherever, that things can get recycled um, mm -hmm. and not thrown out. It, yeah. it's, it's very confusing to, to, to figure out what do you put in your recycle bin. Mm -hmm. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. I, I never yeah. know. <laughs> you know you know, another little, just a little thing, but I spend about mm -hmm. half my time down just off the Danforth. And the all the public litter bins are divided into three categories. Um, the problem is, is they're not emptied very often. So when the recycling gets full, people just put it into the litter. And I realize that, you know, we're trying to, you know, maintain budgets and, and they don't want to hire too many people to empty these. But if we're really trying to emphasize, try to recycle, um, those public bins along the Danforth should be, you know, they should be regularly picked up um, mm. so that people don't feel, well, nobody cares anyway. It's all going, like there's this attitude oh. down there in the Danforth. It's all going the same place. And, oh. and unfortunately, I think I might believe that it is all going in the same place. Uh, um, yeah. So, so anyway. Yeah. That's a really key thing because that answers the last question here too, which is what do we need to, to enable us to be able to do these things? And that's a very key thing we need consistency which Stephen mentioned and also this yeah this support and this showing that's actually happening what we're doing now I don't want to single you out to them but this we haven't talked about at all the green spaces and um Suleiman's doing a project with mangrove plant planting in uh in Africa right now um and as far as our city goes I don't know if you've got any insight about Toronto Suleiman but uh, for me, I, I really think the second one, where the where the tree cover is needed most, is a, is a key one. Yeah, and not just so that we can actually participate, but yes. So I don't know if anybody else has an opinion on the green space in in the city, um, but I know here there's like what do they call them? Urban deserts, and they capture the heat. And it's so bad for people, especially people in my area that don't have air conditioning. It's just, it's like a health threat for sure. So I think the green, like the equitable distribution of the urban forest could be, it could be a good point. Yeah, well, you know, I mentioned it earlier um, with trellis because we're up in the hydro right-of-ways. Wow. The, the reason, you see, people forget the reason we have all this tarmac is because we have cars and trucks and buses. If we didn't have cars and trucks and buses, if, tr if transportation was just in little pods moving just above us, then you can tear that up and replant. And the, but the challenge is, is that we have so much inertia. And even as the cost, as I mentioned earlier, you know, 750, well, 700 plus million a kilometer to build these LRTs, like they're mortgaging 20, 30, 40 years out without any thought about, hey, we want to tear this up and plant trees and stuff. So, yeah. so I think it's it's right. Everybody wants to increase 
the foliage, um, mm -hmm. but it's going to take mm -hmm. a real initiative to do that. And, mm -hmm. and that there, there are hundreds, probably thousands of people that work for the city and Metrolinx, et cetera, who are in the other business. They want to pave stuff down. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know yeah. how we change it, but it's going to take well, a real groundswell to do that. Yeah. You know what? I think that again, the corporations coming in and the and the having to shift the whole growth based economy to a donor. You know what I mean? It's all integrated, and I really do think it's key. I wanted to mention also, and this is kind of related and not really, but it's um, the pipelines that are going in in Toronto now that are going to sustain the same kind of energy system. Like, why are they putting in a pipeline when we're, we're having to make such a radical shift at this point to? continue <laughs> just the status quo so you are right uh, uh steve and i think yeah. we have to keep pushing for the bigger integrated yes. changes uh, no we should applaud waterfront toronto now i don't know for sure if they're still no. doing this but the last mm -hmm. time i talked with them they said for sure there's no natural gas pipeline going into the east Donlands, and they were pretty awesome. firm on that but there hasn't been much talk yeah. about it recently yeah but, that would know, be under energy yeah that would be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah because, I mean, if they yeah. did that, mm -hmm. if they really, you know, because they're spending a lot of money getting the river to look really nice down there. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. they were firm, no natural gas pipeline. I mean, I sound, I, I yeah. sound like I'm very, I, I'm, I'm almost, you know, becoming extremist. But, you know, if, if nobody's willing to make the decision, then, then we end up with more smokestacks. And, and they had made that decision some time ago. But since mm -hmm. COVID, I haven't actually been to any of their events. In fact, I'm not even aware that they've had a face-to-face -face event. And it's in those events that you learn how firm they are in some of those types of positions. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there was no well, gas pipeline going in there. So touch wood. Okay, I, I want to underline that, that yes, we should, we should support that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, I did hear late, they did a, a presentation on increasing renewable energy from natural gas from waste recently. So I know they've really they're they're moving ahead with that and i'm not absolutely certain about what that means like the bio the bio waste is uh renewable natural gas i'm not that clear it's, on it's it, methane it's methane is it methane <laughs> yes yeah. of course it is yeah yeah i'm just yeah. not sure if it, i'm not sure how good it is is what i'm saying or how well, exactly exactly over, over one choosing one over another i am hesitant about that one I'm saying, but I know they're moving ahead with it. <laughs> yes, uh, Stephen. I I'm, I always wonder why, um, in hydro fields that are quite large, there are not trees planted there. Um, I mean, I realize that they need a right of way to get their their vehicles to service them, but aside mm -hmm. from that, there seems to be enough room to plant more trees. So I I never understood why that that's the way it is, kind of. Yes. Well, we have three minutes left, so I'm going to stop screen sharing. But you know what? I, I know that there are some things I would like to mention tying those two thoughts together, the green space and, and the hydro corridors. There are some greenway, and Val knows about this too, some greenway projects that are trying to convert some of the hydro corridors into, um, I don't know, Val, if you want to speak to that in, in support of that. Um, oops. Um, yeah, I, I could do, it's called Our Greenway Conservancy. And um, this, there is a, a report uh, coming to council uh, shortly, I think, and it's to run um, a, a greenway. So it's sort of, um, you know, a, a bike and pedestrian pathway and green space right along uh, north of Finch. Um, in the in the northwest part of the city, and it's a beautiful uh, uh, proposal um, that would really be wonderful for um, the people there who um, have been underserviced, um, and it also involves uh, cargo bikes that um, people can uh, use to take to get groceries and so on, because lots of the people there don't don't actually have cars, and it involves building a, a pedestrian sort of bicycle pedestrian bridge um, uh, over the highway um, along the hydro corridor there. So yeah, there's there's mm -hmm. some brilliant ideas uh, developing in that area. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I know one of there's another one, um, and it is a, it's a hydro corridor. So I think your idea, supporting that idea, is, and and the efforts that might be ongoing are great. So I want to highlight Mina's point in the chat there too. Um, Amina is saying that continuing to engage the younger demographic to champion for climate change, especially in the age of information, and leveraging existing platforms to raise awareness on climate change. I think, yeah, the youth, the youth um, energy and voice in the advocacy that's going on there is a tremendous resource. So definitely um, add that to our group point. Um, and Gail, I think you. Yes, I, I don't see very much about adaptation in here. Like we need better flood control because we're going to have these tremendous downpours. We need cooling stations, all right, for heat waves. We need to have a better um, inventory of seniors' homes and facilities and their, their needs under these different circumstances, the possible needs, right? Mm -hmm. like I, I don't see the, the mitigation side is dealt with in, in this, but adaptation uh, is also going to be extremely important in, in centers with very large populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, I'm so glad you brought that up, Gail. I know there are some, it's a resiliency strategy as well. So again, it's like you're not putting them together, right? Like, right. So I'd have, we have to go look at the city's resiliency strategy and see if they cover any of that. But I like that you brought that up here because it needs to be connected. So yeah. Anyway, I think everybody's coming back to the main room. Thank you so much to my breakout group. I think we got a lot of good um, ideas captured. And we'll share the survey link again, probably in the, to the whole group before the end. So you can do this on an individual level as well. So, yeah. Pauline, is that the entirety of the survey? That you, the, the, the three, or I think there was yeah. five topics, but three questions. Yeah, that's it. That, um, and that's, that's basically it, but there's space for comments. And you made lots of good comments, so I would make use of that space. Pauline, since we're all so quiet, could I mention something? Uh, yeah, I'm sure this, everyone would like to hear. This, I'm mm -hmm. talking more about the federal and provincial level of governments, but we will get a lot more cooperation and get a lot of things, including climate change, done much more quickly if we change our electoral system. Part of Fairville, Toronto, and we need to change our electoral 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 system that 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 goes that involves more cooperation between parties instead of adversarial politics. I, I don't think anybody will disagree. Um, no, I, I agree think, too. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a challenge in Ontario because we don't. The province doesn't have any money. We don't print our own money. We're, we're in extremely heavy debt. Um, we have to look to the feds, mm -hmm. um, just similar to the, to the way other countries look to their federal governments for, for big capital investments. But, uh, but yeah, we have a system where it doesn't matter, you know, someone will say red, the other person will say blue, even if red makes sense that day, or vice versa, if you know what I'm saying. And we're all nervous even talking about it because it seems to be so political even to say red and blue. So, so, you know, this is, this is the thing. I, I agree. We need to come up with some way that, that people can work together more effectively. Yes, not only cooperation at certain levels like federal or provincial, but to cooperation between levels also. Yep. Okay, yep. so we're all back together. And uh, I think we just have um, a few minutes. I mean, if we're going to end at 8.30, we have like three minutes. We can take a couple minutes more, but we can hear back uh, from um, insights in the groups. 
and encourage everybody to fill in your, the survey yourself as well and spread the word with other people. Uh, we have till the 26th to get it in. Um, Colleen, do you want to say a word or two about, did you, you had a group, right? You had a group? Yes, we were in this main space and I that was an, a very uh, great system um, challenging conversation. And it is, I'm, I'm so glad we have it on record because um, it is, it was so insightful, but it was big picture level. It was like, we need more aggression. We need cooperation at all levels and in, in internally. And it just covered so many bases. So we had um, a wide ranging discussion um, that I'm so glad we captured. I thank my group um, for being so progressive. Let me call it that. I think it was progressive. So thank you. Thank you. And, and Anne, do you want to um, say some words about your group? Um, also a great discussion. Thank you, everybody. Um, lots of good ideas about um, how to inform um, people in Toronto about climate action and climate initiatives that are already taking place and that need to take place. Um, <laughs> observations about needing to know the sort of nitty gritty of things um, and sort of pin the city down on things. For, for instance, um, Amelia Rose raised a really important point about the electrification of electric buses. We need to have a deadline for that. So um, some, I wrote down, I was furiously writing everyone's recommendations and um, really thank everyone for all their contributions. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. And um, Lorna, you had a group too. Yeah, yeah, we also had a very good discussion, uh, lots of great ideas. Um, one of the overarching themes was that we needed to, to look at actions that are going to be transformative. So not just baby steps, but things that are actually gonna make a difference. Um, we talked a lot about um, the need to, to be um, retrofitting the houses, but you know, renewables, energies in, in all sorts of different ways. A couple of, couple of things that I thought were interesting, the um, supporting lower emission freight and last mile delivery was something that I hadn't really considered too much. So I enjoyed that bit of the discussion. And also the increasing circularity was something that everybody thought was important around packaging and repairs and uh, you know being able to, um, to have a less wasteful society. And then trees, you know, we talked about the urban forest and uh, one of the points that was made was that it's one thing to plant the trees, but they also have to be watered and they have to be looked after. So um, that's an important point for the city to be uh, taking into consideration. We need a, a strong urban forestry department. But yes, thanks everybody. It was a good discussion. And uh, I, think, I think we all made some headway in deciding what would be put in our survey. Okay, can I just invite everyone then to um, smile? If you don't mind, I'll take a screenshot of our little workshop tonight. Uh, if you're not visible right now, you could make yourself visible. I'll give you a minute for that. Um, a great big thank you for people coming because you, you just wouldn't believe how much this level of engagement drives what the city is doing. We really make a difference to what the Transform to Your staff uh, uh, can do. And our engagement with the councillors means that they know we're paying attention and we, they, know, they know we want climate action. They, they know that from all our deputations we've been doing for several years. And keeping that going is so important. So I'm going to take a photo. Everybody smile. <laughs> there we go. You're looking wonderful. Thank you. And, um, and uh, we just uh, would really like to express our thanks for you, you coming. Um, we are doing um, a discussion about the election tomorrow night. So if, if uh, I should just pop the Eventbrite link, unless someone else has it handier than I do, into the chat in case you'd like to um, join us for that discussion tomorrow night, because we have an election coming at the federal level and we have the opportunity to really um, make a difference. Okay, I have the link right here as it turns out. So I will pop it in. Uh, fellow facilitators, is there anything that more that we need to be to be sharing with folks tonight? Oh, look at your cat, uh, Colleen. 
got a message for us. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Lorna. Um, and thank you, Mark. Mark was our tech. Thank you so much. And um, honestly, everybody, thank you for coming. I hope you had a good uh, experience tonight. And let's keep working together because we're making the difference uh, at all the levels. Um, are being engaged in motivating others to get engaged. We have lots of other programs like Kitchen Table Climate Conversation Program. Um, we do webcasts. We have a webcast coming up on food and farming. Um, so there's lots of additional programs. You're all welcome to take part in, and it's great to learn um, what other groups are up to sharing that information. I'll just find the webcast link and put it in for the food and farming, which is August the 9th. Actually, I don't know if I see it. So I might just send you a follow-up note with a few of these links in it. Um, if, you, if you signed up on Eventbrite, you'll, you'll get it that way. So yeah, okay, so are we good to go, everybody? Are we good to go? Let's say goodbye. Wave, thank you. Thank okay. you. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Oh, you're still there, Mark. Yes, I'll Very stop good. the recording. Good job.